All right. Well, I, I I wouldn't mind talking about Toronto being bad. Okay. They were also on my list, my three teams that I wasn't thrilled with their offseason. Great. Because it, it really hurts me because I, I, was, I definitely was someone telling Raptors fans to relax all season. Um, and it just like they just keep taking L. So, you know, they essentially re- re-sign Jakob Pertl who they gave yep. up a first round draft pick for. So it was kind of necessary. And, and then, and, and signaled to everyone, like we're running it back. We're going to try this again. We think we're going to be good next year with sort of a similar formula to how we ended last year. And then Fred Van Vliet left <laughs> and they immediately replaced him with Dennis Schroeder. And now this team that had so little ball handling and almost no shooting lost their main ball handler and shooter. He was really bad last year. I think oh, like yeah. Fred Van Vliet has to take a big chunk of the blame for what happened to Toronto in just like you're supposed to be kind of everything as, as a shooter for this team. And you just, you shot so poorly in all kinds of scenarios. The Raptors were all missing open threes at the beginning of the season, but Fred never stopped missing. Like he just missed shots all year as well coming off screens, his like off the dribble heroics that used to save them a lot the year before just completely dried up this year. And, but you have to think with a shooter that they're likely to bounce back. Um, and now the Raptors are just awkwardly stuck with like, Oh, once again, we got no guards. Grady Dick probably can't solve all our shooting issues on his own. I was thinking like Fred Van Vliet bouncing back plus Grady Dick playing in the rotation. Mm -hmm. um, Plus Gary Trent Jr. Maybe having at least a little bit of a bounce back. Toronto might just like have the season they were supposed to have last year. But now it's like, now it feels like the sky is falling and that a Siakam trade is coming just a critical shortage of ball handling, a critical shortage of shooting. And they're just now stuck being like, Oh, are we just going to like stay the course and lose Siakam and OG and an next year? Or are we going to um, finally start panicking the way that our fans want us to panic? Cause Raptors fans have basically been like panic, please yeah. decide just, just panic trade all our players for whatever is offered. Just take the best offer available. We just need you to, to panic and pivot into a Scotty Barnes rebuild, despite having no idea if Scotty Barnes is ever going to be like a good NBA level scorer. Yeah. The Raptors kind of drive me crazy with kind of their hesitance to act. And, you know, I think it can't be understated. Teams do not lose star players for nothing in return anymore. Like it doesn't happen. You know, star yeah. players don't hit free agency anymore at this day and age. Um, and, you know, like Fred Vindley good enough where despite his, his poor efficiency last year, I'd still say I mean, he, he's got a three year, $120 million contract. So yeah, obviously yeah. Fred he's really, really good. He's, he's regarded as a star player um, and, and losing a, an asset of that level with nothing in return is, um, I don't know, like maybe mismanagement is the wrong word, but it, it's a very poor like prediction of how things were going to play out, you know? Yeah. Um, we're headed into the off season where there's no significant free agents other than Fred Van Vliet, really. Um, he's kind of like the only guy. And there are a couple of teams that could throw him a big offer. Uh, and you're blindsided yeah. by the fact that one of them did that, you know? Um, <laughs> you just got to a big offer. a little bit better. I mean, it was a big offer, but like, what else is Houston going to do with their cap space? Like they don't even have any, contract extensions coming up for the next couple of years. I, I just think like someone offering Fred Van Vliet, the whole boatload of money should have been maybe a little bit foreseeable. I think when they were reading the lay of the land around the time that they would have traded Fred Van Vliet, there was a big time James Harden back to the Rockets rumors. I don't think that they like Houston profiled as a major likely Van Vliet landing spot, but yeah, still like they were over, they, they, regardless of what the projections were, they got proved wrong and they were overconfident about their ability to, to re-sign Fred Van Vliet or work out a sign and trade like they did with Lowry. And um, yeah, the Raptors just keep taking L's. And I really thought that, like I've said it a few times in this podcast, like I thought they just were bad for bad luck reasons, but then they they reacted to it very, very poorly. And now they're actually in a bad situation, which is just all you like hater Raptors fans out there. This doesn't, prove you right entirely like you were still yeah. 
the most histrionic fan base in the NBA and you don't get points for that. Um, I, I was thinking like, I was thinking the other day with the Raps fans in mind, like what if every year, what if this year, let's just do it. We're, uh, you know what? I'm putting it out on this podcast for our millions of listeners. We're doing a competition this year. Every team fan base competes to be the least whiny fan base in the NBA. It's a competition. We're going to give it an award on this podcast at the end of next season. Um, so everyone, I really want you to try your best to be the least whiny fan base in the I mean, NBA. I'm, and I'm going to call the Spurs for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Spurs. Uh, you know, I don't feel. I don't. I feel like who else? Who else is famously unwhiny? You know what? Timberwolves fans, not whiny. That's true. Um, I feel like I don't, Jazz, I don't see the not whiny. fans whine a whole lot. Yeah, teams that have just like had it so bad that like. Yeah that's like it's just outrageous to we just want anything to believe in kind of thing um so. yeah so so here's the thing with um with the raptors i i just think they need to make a trade like they're in a really bad spot right now uh, they might have the worst half court offense in the nba this upcoming season unless they can get a lot of offensive rebounds um and they have three guys for the two forward spots who can't i mean it you can put them all on the floor at the same time, but it doesn't really work that well, especially when you don't really have a playmaker. The only thing I want to say about that is that I feel like OG gets grouped in with those two guys too often. Like I see why like Pascal and Scotty Barnes are both present some logistical fit problems. I think you can play OG with anyone. Like there's just no world in which OG I is mean, not like you can, but like he's a really good shooter, a really good catch and shoot guy. Um, yeah. Like he's the best, like he's the best perimeter defender in the NBA, um, best wing defender in the NBA. Like, obviously he doesn't solve every single problem on your roster, but I don't think OG should ever be pointed at as like, as a difficult fit piece. I just think if you're putting OG and Siakam and Scotty Barnes on the court together, along with Yaka Pertl, that fifth guy in the rotation better be like an absolutely awesome get to the rim guy um, or otherwise you're going to have some major offensive struggles. Right. Yeah. I just think that's more about Pirtle and Barnes and Siakam. Sure. Like, than it is about OG. I just think like he's the, he's one of the least difficult to slot into a lineup pieces that can possibly exist in the, in the NBA. I, I get it. But also at the same time, I feel like he's the most tradable and moving off of OG is, an easier way to fix your problems than trading Siakam because Siakam right I, now is oh, the guy coming up into all the trade rumors. But big, like I just don't think that Scotty Barnes and Siakam are, are a viable like lineup combo in long term, and I've been worried about that since they drafted him. I'm like, I mean, and I was I, I was big on them drafting Scotty Barnes, like I wanted them to do that back when people wanted to draft Suggs, but like now that they need to build a real team around there, it's like two playmaking forwards who don't really shoot the ball well enough and don't quite pressure the rim at the level that you would like them to. Um, They're not complementary to each other. Um, Maybe if it was like those two and like elite shooting at every other position, but then OG is not the problem there because maybe OG is not an elite shooter, but he's very good, especially like yeah. late last season. OG was like, I think OG led the league in true shooting possession post all-star break. Okay. Like guy, guy was just on fire. Um, I guess it's just like, if you're trading Siakam, I'm assuming you trade him over Scotty Barnes. I don't know. Maybe they trade Scotty Barnes, but like, who are you getting in return? That solves all your other issues. If you trade one of those guys. Yeah. And I don't, I think, I think is that, I think it's going to be a, a, challenging trade thing but i just think that you can like you can pivot into like feeling like you're building around og and scotty barnes more than you can around siakam who is um who's 29 now and you want to hear my crazy selfish trade idea (laughs) yeah for the raptors and this is totally coming out of like what i want to happen and maybe not out of what's the most realistic but you know i just see um out of any team in the nba the team that most desperately needs um a guy who can attack a defense um, and be both a elite shooter off the catch and off of the dribble, um, as well as just kind of like, you know, make plays for others at a reasonable level is, is the Raptors. Um, mm-hmm. Just they desperately need a guard who can do a lot of stuff on offense. This is a Lillard thing, isn't it? No. Um, this oh. is a Tyler Hero thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I just think, so the, the Blazers want 
the heat to trade Tyler Hero for someone else uh, before we're interested in moving Lillard to the heat. Um, and out of all the teams that most desperately need a guy like Tyler Hero. But you I mean, do you the think Raptors the Raptors are going to me. trade OG Ananobi for Tyler Hero? OG Ananobi is on a one-year deal, and then it's a player option, which he's going to Yeah, but no, but no one's excited about building with them. This is the problem that Heats fans have. They're just like, this guy's really good. Why does no one want him? It's just like, he's paid a lot, and no one can feel they're going anywhere with Tyler Hero. He's like an innings eater. Yeah, like, but the Raptors literally... are determined to be a 42-40 and 40 team. Well, but they're only trading their assets if they're determined to move in one direction or the other. They're not like, that's like, they're, they're not going to make a trade so they continue to do that. Like, I just think OG yeah. Ananobi is so much more valuable. So you're going to be needing to send more value back. And Miami can't facilitate that. They can't send value to both the Raptors and the Blazers. So I just think that like, yes, a team will take Tyler Hero but a team will not give up a player that's like clearly better than Tyler Hero. And again, like OG Ananobi is the best wing. To, OG Ananobi is like a the kind of piece that pushes a team over the top into 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 like championship favorite status. Right. Tyler Hero is a guy that you're like, like he he just missed their entire run to the to the finals and no one cared. So here's my question with OG Ananobi: If you're planning on retaining him, no, he's on a cheap deal, so you can't extend him for fair value right? Because the extension isn't going to be large enough. Um, so he's going to hit free agency in some capacity. And, you know, if the Raptors are still incredibly mediocre a year from now, and there's a bunch of other teams that are willing to offer OG 30 plus million a year, what's the motivation for him to stay? Bird rights. And role size. Right. So they can sign him, but like, why is OG and Anobis, you know, signing up for that? Um, because like the other, I mean, it really depends on who the other bidders are, but like yeah. how, like how teams with cap space to offer a contract that can compete with what Toronto is going to be willing to pay for him that also offer a better situation. OG Ananobi is, is still young. Like I think yeah, they can, 26. yeah, I think they can, I think, I mean, I like Siakam is like my favorite Raptor like of, of all time, but I don't, I, I, I really wanted them to trade Scotty Barnes early when his value was at its highest. I knew that yeah, they were never going fun. to do that, but like, I, I just felt like I really like Scotty Barnes, but I felt like it was, and still feel like it's just kind of complicated to get him. They, they were treating him like a no brainer. Like every Raptors fan was like, this is a blue chip, like no brainer. Um, like, we, you know, all NBA type guy. And I'm like, he still needs to add like one major thing to his game before he gets there. And there's no guarantee that happens. It could, but um, when it was like, when he was the piece that needed to go back for like Kevin Durant or, or Dame Lillard, I'm kind of just like, I would have been, I would have been aggressive and sneaky with that. Instead, they've kind of just like projected Scotty Barnes is our future, no matter how good he is. <laughs> like, and I think that could really come back to haunt them kind of thing. But I don't, I don't like, OG, unless you're getting back crazy value for him, I just like I'm just not doing it for Tyler Hero. That's that's like that's not even close to what I'd consider a useful deal for the Raptors. They're just like the team. Like it feels like from the Raptors' perspective that they have this mismatched team that doesn't really work um, in a lot of different ways. And you know you're probably heading for another sub 500 season if no moves are made. And yet, from Masai Ujiri's perspective. Despite the team not being that not that good and clearly needing to make a change, all these players have such incredibly high value that no one can trade for them. Yeah, yeah, it's an awkward fit thing. But I, I just don't think I just there's too many there's been too much talk about the Raptors solving their fit problem by trading their player that doesn't present a fit problem. Like he's just so low on the list of things that yeah. are like the problem there. I guess my question um, is more for value. It's like, okay, the Raptors might see OG Ananobi as someone who's worth awesome role player plus four unprotected first round picks. But if the market for him isn't there, then, I mean, I, I don't know. I can claim my car. Well, worth then the market won't be no there. No one is willing to pay that. <laughs> is it really? But then, but then who's going to be willing to pay him like a, you know, like max dollars on, on a, on a con, like on a, in free agency. Well, I mean, Jeremy Grant got 32 million a year. I think OG will. Yeah. But he got it with his incumbent team. Yeah. Like, again, I just think I like, like teams competing against, I don't know. Like, yeah, maybe they lose OG for nothing. That's possible. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't like panic trade OG for like 
something that doesn't improve your situation. I guess it's not you a panic know. trade. I just I just see OG as getting a greater return than a Siakam. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Siakam's a better player. He is, but he's Siakam. on a one-year deal and he's older. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, Siakam, Siakam has become pretty underrated, I think, because people get annoyed with Raptor fans overrating him. But like, look at his. Yeah. I mean, like, think the about. <laughs> Like, think about what New York would like. New York would have to add draft picks to trade Julius Randle for Pascal Siakam, and Julius Randle made an All NBA team. Like Pascal Siakam yeah. can come in and dramatically change a team's makeup. I think like people also just forget. Last time Pascal Siakam was allowed to be like a finisher off star level pressure, like he was like an elite efficiency scoring monster. Yeah, like who also just like play defense across five positions and help your rebounding your transition game. Like get Sia- like Siakam as a people also just like, Oh, you're going nowhere with Siakam as your best player. I'm like, they won 50 games with Siakam as their best player two years ago. They were like, they were like a, like, they, like you have like, they were for all people complaining about how bad they were offensively. They were an above average offensive team. Like it's not like people acting like the Raptors won 20 games last year. Um, Maybe I'm overacting a bit by saying they might be the 30th best half court offense. They might be like the 25th best half court offense, but I mean, they were it's not gonna be good. They were 11th, right? Do you like? Do you see what I mean? We're like the Raptors hysteria. Like people act like like, awesome transition team and got an insane amount of offensive rebounds. So their problem, their their biggest problem was crunch time scoring. Like they lost all these close games. That's what I mean. Like when you really have to generate an efficient shot shot against a set defense, they really struggle to do it. Yeah. Um, and they still, and that's, that's a really hard piece to pick up. Hey, but Tyler hero. <laughs> I mean, Tyler hero would help with that. It's just, yeah, he totally would. That would, that would be his actual big import. You give up your second best player for him. Exactly. Um, anyways, that's enough Raptors histrionics. Um, so pivoting into a, into a bad team, let's visit or a team that we don't like the offseason of, or I don't like the offseason of, and I think you probably feel the same. I'm going to guess. Let's go to Jordan Poole's old team, the Golden State the Warriors. Warriors. Okay, yeah. To me, this just feels like the classic group of old guys hanging out at the end of their careers. Whole, like it feels like the, the the way the Boston Celtics were in the uh, mid 2010s when KG and Pierce. I guess Allen was already gone at this point. And then like, there was kind of like, you know, Shaquille O'Neal came there for a bit. Rasheed Wallace was there for a bit, just kind of like old guys would go there and hang out. And um, they would loom as a, as a intimidating playoff opponent because of the collective basketball IQ, but they're, they're running short on actual they're You know, they're getting, they're vulnerable to young teams. Now, Steph Curry is still something close to an MVP level player, I think in the NBA and, wouldn't be surprised if he was again this year, but now it's, they brought in Chris Paul um, who looked, you know, I mean, got injured again in the playoffs last year and couldn't defend anyone in the playoffs when he was healthy. He got injured and no one really like felt that much worse for Phoenix's chances, which isn't a great. Yeah. It didn't, for. didn't really have much of an impact on <laughs> Phoenix's ability to match up against the Nuggets. I don't think. Yeah, at least that's how it felt. Who knows? Because we didn't get to see it happen. But um, yeah, it just it, lo- the Clippers yeah. and the Warriors, I feel like, are both in the same bucket where they're they're aging. Their uh, their their pieces surrounding their star player aren't aren't really quite good enough to put them into true contender status the previous year. Um, and instead of changing things or shaking the things up, where they're just kind of like, well, that didn't work. Let's run it back. You know, <laughs> I think that, it again. I think. For teams like Golden State, I think they're looking for ways out. They're like, they're they're looking at their options. I just think it's actually a really hard thing to do. Like you're looking to build a bridge to the future, and Golden State was has been, you know, blowing that trumpet of the next, like you know, preparing for the next era of Golden State basketball, and they but they just haven't been able to do it. I think it's a really hard thing to pivot out of like a dynasty into in, into something yeah. else. So I think they looked at the options for how they would move forward, and they, and they're just like okay, I guess like losing Draymond for nothing kind of sucks. And I think that, you know, trying to rebuild around Jordan Poole and and um, James Wiseman kind of sucks. So like, let's cut our losses on those things and yeah, run it back for another year. Hope we get lucky as we continue to look for 
possible bridges to the future. Um, on that yeah, note, this is like Jonathan Kaminga. Mm-hmm. This is a, this is a make or break season for the Warriors and Jonathan Kaminga at the same time. Yeah, I mean he's he is their way out. Like Jonathan Kaminga being good <laughs> is yeah is kind of their way out of the the mess. I mean, like currently the Warriors have seven players in the roster if Chris Paul is healthy, so maybe more like six players that you can rely on on a playoff rotation. Um, and some of these guys aren't super high end, like Clay Thompson. You know, if his his legs are gone and he can't make threes by the time the playoffs start, you know. Yeah. Um. You know, and hopefully Wiggins is healthy this year, but. They just they don't have like a complete team that you feel like really good about all the pieces involved. I don't think like they need one of the young guys to step it up, whether it's Moody or Kaminga. Um, could be Trace Jackson Davis as well. You know, like he, I think he was a four year senior. Um, yeah, college all four years. I, was, college. I mean, really I had him as a, I had him as like a mid first round pick. So I think yeah, I'm obviously going like high late on. second round is obviously a steal for a guy yeah. with his his skill set. So. Um, Good, a great yeah, skill set well, for them too. Like specific, I mean, obviously he can't shoot, which is which is never a good thing. But in terms of like a you know like a, a short roll big or like a, a, with a little bit of rim running gravity, who could post up mismatches and pass the ball. I think like he has a chance to. It would be really cool, and I'd feel better about the Warriors if Trace Jackson Davis could count uh, could uh, make the rotation this year, could crack the yeah. rotation. Um, and and Brandon Pajemski is also like. A potent, like you know, I like their young guys. I think they all have a chance to be something interesting there, but I don't know. Are we are we going to see like Corey Joseph, Chris Paul backcourts, like just like really solid veteran guys that don't act that can't really move? That are more like stabilizers than players that move the needle. Uh, I think they yeah. can be really like solid and annoying to play against, but like they just feel like they're really running short on non Curry firepower from anywhere like are we gonna see chris paul steph curry clay thompson like lineups like yes and that I, that, that that sounds that, like that, that sounds doesn't rough. that doesn't sound like a good lineup to be running out there yeah and and then they're still so small like they looked mm-hmm. so small in the playoffs all the time like they were like they had to throw so much at sacra like they, they had to go so hard to it worked they like they ruined Demant- demontis Sabonis's life um, but it felt like they were putting a lot of resources into doing that. And then the next round they matched up against a bigger team and they were just like, Oh, we're so small. Like Yvonne Looney is by far our biggest player and he's a small center. Uh, Draymond Trace Jackson a little, Davis should help a little bit, but he's also an undersized big. So yeah. Yeah. He won't feel undersized in golden state though. He's a big man. on oh, campus. He's, he's huge. He's probably like yeah. their largest player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, six, or, nine, or, Dario, yeah. And they brought in Dario Saric as well, who I think is another guy that fits really well, you know, really brings oh. me back to uh, when they had uh, Nemanja Bielitsa, Bielitsa there a couple of years ago, the, like good fit in terms of like a crafty screener. Dario Saric also loves to like murder guards on switches, like just like kind of like turns into DeMontis Sabonis when you like give him the right matchup kind of thing. If he could bounce back from injury, I think he's a good fit there. I think this team is like kind of good. It just doesn't really feel like they definitely did not take a step closer to winning a championship again. Yeah, kind of at best, they, you know, I just kind of remained the same from last season, which was a team that wasn't good enough to win the title. So they calcified is how I would describe what they did this year. They're just like, we're the same team and we've calcified around that identity by bringing in more like old veterans to do the same kind of to play the same style we want to play. Chris Paul is a very weird wild card though, just in terms of like, he does not play the style that they like to play. And, the, um, but hopefully you always hope for old players like that to Chris Paul totally has a lot of skills and could find some kind of interesting role to play. I think, mm-hmm. um, I don't think it's out of the question that Chris Paul makes an interesting and positive impact there. Okay. I'm going to go with the uh, 76ers of Philadelphia as my, um, oh great! I've got notes on them too, and I've got it as bad as well. So this is your third bad team. Have we gotten all my bad teams? I think so. Yeah, I'm all positive after this. Okay. Um, great. Philly to me is clearly just aiming for cap space in 2024. Yeah, but for what? Well, potentially Pascal Siakam, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Jeru Holiday, OG Ananobi, Kristaps Porzingis, 
Lonzo Ball, Catavius Caldwell Pop. Like all like when you look at the player options, those are the players that Philly's after. I just feel like every um, year we have all these names that could potentially hit free agency, and then I agree, none I agree. of them hit free agency. <laughs> I am I have grown so tired of Daryl Morey's all or nothing approach to running a team. Yeah. Like I know like I know that this kind of thinking took the NBA by storm when Maury was in Houston and Hinky did the process over in Philadelphia. But like, I, it's so boring and like, you have to like, it has to hit to hit. And when it doesn't, it's just so miserable. Um, And I don't even just think like, he, he just, he, I don't know if it's something about his like personality where it always like, we always imagine Daryl Maury thinks he's playing 40 chess or whatever. Like maybe Daryl Maury is actually like, struggling right now and it's like oh we're in a bad situation but um just honestly as a fan and a basketball analyst i find daryl Morey teams a bit depressing to follow like they're always trying to go all in or positioning themselves to go all in and i get that but like at, like i enjoy the different steps of building a contender and daryl Morey tries to just only go be at one or nine on if if or, you know, on this, on this, on this 10 step plan that I'm just making up right now, but it's oh, I like, you, it's, like on the scale of competence. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, I, just like, he has, he's not, never really piloted a rebuild. I don't think so. At least not. In well, time. he got to, he turned Houston into the Yao T-Mac thing and yeah. then that fell apart and they right. languished for a bit. And then he, um, brought in James Harden and tried to pair him with Dwight Howard, but it's always like star plus star. And I'm just like, put a team that makes sense around Joel Embiid. I think Harden's going to be stuck there because I don't think anyone yep. wants Harden. I don't and... think Daryl's willing to trade him for a non-star, even though the 76ers depth sucks. Um, they have so many holes and trading. Yeah, who's left on their team? <laughs> trading Harden for like three decent Clippers role players probably gives the 76ers the best chance of competing this year, providing that he yeah. is healthy in the playoffs. Uh, but Daryl's not going to do that. So, yeah. Um, they've got, they got, <laughs> Daryl Morey got poison pilled, which was very funny. Like that was the, the Paul Reed contract. The like Paul Reed contact contract seemed designed to taunt Daryl Morey. <laughs> like it's, it just seemed like it was like a spite contract. It was like, it had, it had really funny language in it. Just like, um, Oh, this, but like this year only becomes guaranteed if you make the conference finals, but if like, I dare you to make the conference finals, Daryl Morey. Oh, and yeah. if you do like, you're going to end up paying Paul Reed $23 million the next anyways. Like, it's just like, it was, it was pretty funny. Um, but they were they were they were stuck. They let Jalen McDaniels go. I was a little bit surprised by that. Shake Milton's gone. George Niang's gone. They pretty much l- refused to take on any long term money, which means like, oh, you're you're aiming for cap space in 2024. But Joel Embiid is 30. You've already you wasted a year of his prime the year before. While you're wasting another year this industry. year. Yeah, it's just like you can't really feel great about that. So, but the players they've signed: Mo Bamba, Patrick Beverly. They brought in draft picks I wasn't particularly excited about. Ricky Council and Terquavion Smith. Um, Ricky Council, oh, those, I don't know. Those were, those were both undrafted guys. Oh, signed. yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, not draft picks, but um, rookies. Yeah. Um, which and Those know, are pretty good if you're, you're right, just you're right. As signing undrafted, that's like, guys who are left after the draft. Yeah, they, they could definitely they – could, they could pop. And if they, and if they do, there's, like, they're both really talented. But I don't know what's what's left in the cupboard here. Like they're just waiting for Tobias Harris, like Tobias Harris and James Harden to expire, and they're going to build a whole new team around Joel Embiid at age thirty-one. So I feel bad for yeah. Nick Nurse signing there, but I don't know why he was in a rush to do that. But um, yeah, I mean, we're assuming they're extending Tyrese Maxey. I mean, he's restricted right um, next off season, but it might yeah. be for a whole lot of money, um, and then you're left with enough cap space you know james harden's his cap, his cap holds off kind of the small. books right that's true so james harden's off the books um tobias harris is off the books i mean you can sign a star player if one is available in free agency i just i have yeah. my doubts that a that's going to happen and b that they'd be willing to sign in philadelphia i think he's looking at that la clippers situation uh and that's where he's hoping to find his i think paul george is the target 
okay, you signed Paul George. Paul George is hurt every year in the playoffs. I mean, yeah. there's a core of Maxi, Paul George, Joel Embiid, and an extremely subpar surrounding cast of role players enough yeah. to compete. <laughs> Doesn't sound great, but this is the path that Philly is walking down right now. Yeah. Um, and having things fall apart in the playoffs. At least there's no more Doc. At least they've gotten rid of one of their playoff choke artists and Doc Rivers. Now they only have two. Two left. left <laughs> in, instead of three. Yeah. Uh, we're in agreement there. All right. That about wraps up our off-season thoughts midway here. Oh, I had summer. one more bad team. Oh, you had what? Who's bad? Who's still bad? <laughs> do we want Do we want to touch on this or do we want to just be done? I'm okay either way. You want to talk about the Bucks, don't you? Yeah. There are, they, are they that bad? <laughs> No, I mean, I... <laughs> I'm just like, they didn't lose Brook or Middleton, which was yeah, what was true. sort of the scariest. And the, you know what? They also got some young guys in. Let's talk, we can talk, we can do two minutes on the Bucks, and then we're getting out of here. Yeah, I just thought Milwaukee, for the most part, stood pat on a team that, I mean, some people had them as their, um, you know, Eastern Conference Finals representatives from last year. Um, I think you picked them as that. I think I was win, yeah. I was much lower on the Bucks chances and I continue to be after this offseason cuz they made kind of zero meaningful offseason changes whatsoever from a team I didn't think was good enough to win the title last year. But so. I I only saw an opportunity for them to get worse, not to get better. Like, you know, they they had they had their own free agents to take care of uh, and they had a limited ability to do that. They managed I think to get Middleton and Brook back on reasonable value rather than huge overpays in my opinion. So I thought that was a win. Um, they brought in another shooter in Malik Beasley. Hard to be excited about that. I like Andre Jackson, but I don't see him playing minutes with Giannis. So uh, I don't imagine him being a big deal in his rookie season. I don't really get the point of signing Robin Lopez considering they, like they already tried that. And it the helps them scheme. get Brooke back. <laughs> Maybe that was it. Right. But uh, yeah. I think like, it's not like he's going to come in like, what sucked about when both Lopez's were on the Bucks together was that they just had to play drop coverage for like every minute of the game. But if yeah. he's just going to be there to be like a cool dude, Robin <laughs> Lopez is a very cool dude. So they just yeah. upped their cool dude status. Um, they lost Joe maybe, Ingles. Maybe it means we'll see more Giannis at center when uh, Brook is yeah. sitting. Well, they also lost Javon Carter, which I think matters because he was pretty yeah. like effective and useful for them in that role. But Hopefully we get more marge on Beauchamp this next year. Yeah, Javon Carter was like one of their only good perimeter defenders outside of Drew last year. Yeah, yeah. But hopefully also Chris Middleton is like healthy and able to do a little bit of that. um, I hope so. I just think this is a team that has sucked at guarding wings for quite a while and got worse. Um, And they lost one of their two good point of attack defenders that was on the roster from last year. Yeah. Um, and I think Jason Tatum is going to average 50 points per game against this team in the playoffs. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's basically like they the, they had P.J. Tucker for one year and they won a championship. Yeah. And then they went right back down that hole, which is why I think like Beauchamp and, and, and other young wings they bring on are worth keeping an eye on. Jay Crowder still exists and they did re-sign him. So um, it's, I just like, I mean, the Bucks just, I think it was a bit of a fluky situation in which Giannis got injured. And Miami absolutely was outrageously on fire in a way that you just can't really account for. Um, yeah. And they don't have the, they've got a new coach. So I don't know. I can see why you're like down on, on the bucks or just like, you just see this kind of like aging team that can't get any better, but. Well, I see them as having these major integral weaknesses that are an issue because their main competitor in the Eastern conference is awesome at attacking exactly those weaknesses. Yeah. So have the when's the last when's the last the Bucks played the Celtics in the playoffs two years ago? Chris Middleton got injured and they went to seven games. Yes. Um. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, hopefully the Bucks can just ha- have some better luck and do things that people thought they're going to do this year. But I, I I don't disagree with you and your. On their on their outlaw. I'm probably I'm having pessimistic with some of this. I'm things. probably having some just inherent Bucks negativity about the roster in general. Shape how I look at their offseason. You know, yeah. 
internally, maybe they view this roster as, hey, it would have been good enough if Giannis didn't hurt us back last year, um, and therefore we don't need to change much. I just don't think they have the ability to change much. Like, I don't know where that roster flexibility was going to come from. When you when you go this far down with a core four players, like you're... Yeah, I mean, it's, Phoenix it's, signed three wings for the veterans minimum, and, and maybe maybe Milwaukee couldn't do that. Maybe there weren't wings out there willing to sign with them, but... Um, yeah, can't get but one. Well, I mean, there's a there's a promise of minutes in Phoenix, right? Like, I, like yeah, Milwaukee is a pretty is a is a deeper, thicker roster with just like you know that Giannis and Chris Middleton are going to play a bunch. You know, they're going to play big with Brooke Lopez a lot of the time. I don't know. I just like I, I see why Phoenix was a more exciting option for some of those guys. Yeah, yeah, I suppose if so. they're choosing between minimum opportunities because I think when you're yeah. a wing, you can pick your favorite minimum contract whenever you want. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, that does it for our, our all of our negativity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, system. Yeah. So we'll, we're going to be coming back regularly with just some, you know, projecting teams kind of division by division yep. um, as we go throughout the off season. And there's always, there's always NBA drama that pops up. So we're mm-hmm. always going to have that to talk about. Um, I don't think there is, I don't follow other sports enough to know this, but are the other leagues, the other major leagues this good at keeping the drama going year round or is the NBA no, like, like an outlier? The NFL is that? trying, but um, okay. yeah. they're not quite at the NBA's level. Yeah. We just got the reality TV show thing happening over here in ways that other leagues can't really migrate into. So yeah, the, the NFL NBA has a couple season. of dramatic guys, but <laughs> yeah, they don't yeah. have like the league wide thing yet. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then the, we'll get into international competitions. There's usually interesting things happening this time of the year. WNBA playoffs will roll around. And really, it's just like it's a, it's a good time to be alive as a basketball fan. So, yeah. um, and on that note, you know, everyone kindly remember that ball is life. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>